Good evening. Thank you for joining us for yet another virtual this evening. And the theme really is the PNM's war on democracy, and in particular, Rowley's PNM and their war on our democracy. I would like to thank all our speakers tonight, very powerful presentations uh, in their contributions, touching and concerning matters of national importance. The opposition will continue to do our duty and hold government to account. We will continue to defend the Constitution and all the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Now, we've seen for the past two years, we have been dealing with a global pandemic. But in fact, for the past six years, we have been struggling with a virus that is much worse than the COVID. And that is the dictatorship being spread by the Prime Minister and his corrupt government. Today, we have been plunged into a constitutional abyss by an an unholy alliance of three of the most powerful offices in our land. Office of the Attorney General, Office of the Prime Minister, and the Office of the President. Like a virus, this matter has even gone so far to infect the Police Service Commission, and indeed the TTPS, the Police Service. These high office holders have very serious questions to answer, and you know, on Saturday, I listened um, to the Prime Minister insult and degrade MPs, voters calling them imps, chimps, and pimps, and so it was disgraceful and deplorable. But that is not surprising. You see, Mr. Rowley is lashing, lashing out because he has been caught red-handed. Try as he might, he cannot lie and rant and rave and bully his way out of this time and this mess that he has created. I turn out another very important matter, and I return to the... Uh, to those three office holders and others, I think we must mark the front page of The Guardian today with the COVID deaths reaching 1,600. That's 1,600 of our citizens dying from this COVID. We had 1,350 deaths since the middle of May. So from May to now, 1,350 deaths. On July 1, when there were 850 deaths, 600 deaths between May 19 and June 30, I called for changes to the failed propaganda team of the Al Singh and Paris Ram and the others. A failed team because look at where we are today. At the time, commentators and the media, in an attempt to attack the UNC, condemned my call for changes. Where are these commentators now? come out and say something to the families of all these persons who have since died. 1,350 deaths in 159 days. This is a combined, combined number of murders for the last three years, and yet we have no accountability. You see, in this country, anyone who goes against the popular opinion of the day is condemned and cancelled. Because you want to cancel conversation and opinion, we have now reached, as I said, 1,600 deaths, and that was reported this morning. I pray God none other has occurred within the last several hours. I again call for changes to be made to the Ministry of Health propaganda team. The Singh is a failure. Paris Ram is a failure. Abdul Richards is a failure. Heinz is a failure. There must be a commission of inquiry into all these deaths, as well as from the overall management of the COVID. I had called for that before and I called for it again. In the United Kingdom, we have precedent. There was a call for their prime minister to uh, have a commission of inquiry and they have filed a report. They have filed a report in their parliament about their management of COVID. I call for our country here in our country for an inquiry into the management of COVID and into the very many debts that we've had. I turn now to speak on some very serious matters touching and concerning the Office of the Attorney General. This Attorney General continues to trample on the Constitution. This is because he just, just does not understand the fundamental and sacred principles upon which our Constitution is founded. The principle of the separation of powers is central to the structure of our Constitution. Section 90 of that constitution establishes the office of the DPP. It is an independent office which provides critical functions as a crucial stakeholder in our criminal justice system. One of the essential functions of the DPP 
is to provide advice and guidance to the police service in, when it concerns very serious criminal matters. The Sunday Express, 17th October, published an article entitled DPP Decides on Chandler this week. It reports, amongst other things, and I quote, the office of the AG has provided a legal opinion stating that the attorney Christian Chandler was not in breach of COVID-19 regulations on the day he was detained by Coast Guard officers. Story continues. The advice was given by the office of the AG to Griffith one week after Chandler and 13 others were detained by officers of the Coast Guard. Serious questions must now be asked about the conduct of the AG in relation to this matter. Mr. Chandler is no ordinary citizen. He is the head of the TTPS legal department, and the allegations made against him are very, very serious. So I ask you, how on earth could the AG be advising the police in such a sensitive matter? How could he be doing that? Who made the request to the AG for legal advice? When was the request made and why was it made? Why did the AG not advise the police that he is not a competent authority to render such advice to the police? on an ongoing criminal investigation of this magnitude. Why did he not direct them to the office of the DPP with an explanation, obviously, that the office of the DPP is the only competent authority to give such advice? No matter, far as no matter how many law exams you fail, certainly as an AG, you should have appreciated that you were acting unlawfully by trespassing on the office of the DPP, the independent office of the DPP. Why did the AG not request an explanation from the police service as to why they were bypassing the office of the DPP and coming to him, the AG instead? Why? When they sought advice on such a sensitive investigation. Again, who made this request to the AG for this legal advice and why? The AG has breached the separation of powers doctrine by illegally usurping the role and function of the DPP. And this reckless and careless action is a most dangerous precedent. I want to remind you, this is not the first time that the AG has done this. He seems to be a serial offender in this regard, serial offender. He acts as if he is the DPP's boss and the DPP is his subordinate when nothing could be further from the truth. The DPP is not subject to his influence, direction or control in any form or fashion. Everyone remembers how Farris was parading himself all over the media, warning John Public about the petty fines, fines they would face if they didn't wear masks and did not obey COVID and did not obey the COVID regulations. But all of a sudden, he's advising that Chandler did nothing wrong. This is the latest in a series of transgressions of this type. The AG, as I said before, is a serial offender in this regard. Recently, it emerged that the AG had secretly negotiated a sweetheart deal with Mr. Vincent Nelson QC, whereby he contractually agreed with Nelson for the following things, that he, that is the AG, will not disclose, thereby hide the statement from the public and the parliament, that he will not disclose, thereby hide the statement, that um, contractual document, from any police authorities, prosecuting bodies, tax enforcement agencies, regulatory and disciplinary bodies in foreign jurisdictions. He said that no civil court proceedings will be brought against Mr. Nelson for any matters in which he previously represented the government. Further, that agreement has that he, the AG, will recommend to the DPP that no criminal proceedings be brought against Mr. Nelson in relation to his witness statement. He also agreed in that document that if any person brings a court action against Mr. Nelson for any matters arising out of the indemnification or defamation law suits in relation to the witness statement, government will fully indemnify Mr. Nelson for any damages awarded and legal costs. This is madness on the part of an attorney general of any country. You know, AG enjoys making very derogatory statements with references to MP for Sama Baratharia, Saddam Hussein. I don't know if he has a special likeness for Saddam, young Saddam, he calls him young Saddam. I want to tell the AG, the country will prefer someone who is young and knows the law than someone who may be older and does not know the law. 
Plea bargaining is the sole preserve of the office of the DPP. The DPP has already publicly stated that he knew nothing about the AG's version of Nelson's plea bargaining. And here once again, the AG was playing DPP and police in this manner and in this regard. He wants to operate as judge, a jury, witness and executioner without any respect for the independent institutions. The frightening consequences of this revelation that the AG has been advising the police on sensitive criminal investigations must not ever be underestimated. I'll tell you why. How many other criminal investigations have Arawi or the AG interfered in by playing DPP, by providing legal advice to the police service? Today I ask this question. What other police investigations has the AG advised the police service on without the knowledge of the DPP? In preparing legal opinions, did the AG consult the DPP? Was he also advising on the Camille Robinson Regis matter where she deposited $143,000 in an FCB account without declaring the source of funds? Is he advising on the most recent matter involving MP Foster Cummins? Did he advise on the Darrell Smith investigation? So which other investigations that are criminal investigations has the AG interfered in by giving legal advice? And of course, whenever his behavior is called into question, he waves his famous sub judice rule flag. I tell you, we should rename him the sub judice AG. He is quick to talk about anything and everything except when he is breaching the Constitution. That's when he comes up with the mantra, the chant, sub judice, sub judice. I wish to announce that I intend to write to the Honorable DPP to ask as follows. If he had given his consent for Faris to advise the police service on this matter, the Chandler matter, whether his office was consulted in the preparation of the legal opinion from the AG's office, we said Christian Chandler and his crew were not in breach of the law when they were detained by the Coast Guard. Did that happen without consultation or inform information to the DPP? I would also be calling for an investigation to determine whether the AG is guilty of misconduct in public office and unlawful interference with an ongoing criminal investigation. The Prime Minister's recent speech enforces, really reinforces to me the need for grave concern. The Prime Minister claimed the UNC was attacking the AG. Why? Because the AG was going after those involved in white collar crime. This is an admission from the Prime Minister that the AG is interfering with the independent office of the DPB and their roles and functions, as well as breaching the separation of powers. It appears the Prime Minister himself does not understand the separation of powers that holds our nation together. I make it abundantly clear, the AG has no power to go after anyone for the commission of criminal offences. That is the sole preserve of the DPP and the TTPS. The PM is trying to defend Arawi by saying that he's investigating white collar crime. He is the Attorney General Police Officer. What authority does he have to investigate crime? Is he using and abusing his office and his role as a central authority to go on a political witch hunt? These are serious questions which arise. He is usurping the function of the Office of the DPP and the TTPS legal unit by giving these legal opinions on criminal charges. Why is the Office of the AG sending opinions to the TTPS about whether a contract worker and legal advisor has breached the public health regulations? This is yet another example of the complete lack of respect for independent institutions. The PNM are hell-bent on becoming a dictatorship, and so they have their hands involved in everything. They have interfered with the work of the Police Service Commission. They have interfered with the selection of a commissioner of police. They have in in interfered with parliamentary oversight with respect to the merit lists. They are now interfering very dangerously with police investigation. This is a dangerous trend towards creating a private army, which we were warned about in the Endel Thomas case. And we refuse to stand idly by while the AG manipulates and tramples on our constitution with impunity because he's protected by his prime minister. No one is above the law and we are all equal in the eyes of the law. 
the AG must be called to account for his actions. Whilst the police are investigating the matter of his transfer of the, the Porsche luxury vehicle, it must now also investigate the AG's role in the Chandler investigation and the Vincent Nelson scandal. And by the way, what has happened to the investigation to the gun toting children? Where has that gone? It's gone away. So I say the AG is turning out to be a serial offender in terms of trampling the Constitution and usurping the functions of the DPP. So now this brings me back to dictator prime minister. I said earlier, prime minister, you get catch and there you are ranting and raving. Yesterday I asked some questions about the now famous letter that the prime minister wrote to the police service commission about commissioner of police Gary Griffith. The prime minister claimed that one year ago, he wrote to the commission telling them that he had lost confidence in Commissioner of Police Gary Griffith. This is a very significant revelation. It gives a motive for the subsequent interference in the Police Service Commission and the constitutional duties of the office of the president. Despite the Prime Minister's loss of confidence letter, the commission proceeded to generate a merit list which apparently included the same Gary Griffith and even when thereafter to appoint Griffith to act temporarily. It seems apparent then that the Prime Minister went above their heads to sabotage the process of appointment. The President, Prime Minister and AG have even more serious questions to answer right now as a result of the Prime Minister's hot-headed press conference. One, when specifically did the Prime Minister advise the Commission that he, Prime Minister, had lost faith in the Commission of Police? What caused the loss of faith? Did he write only to the chairman or did he write all members of the commission? Did the AG know of this letter or was he kept in the dark by the prime minister? Did the cabinet agree to undermine the process or was this entirely the prime minister's action? What other action against the commission of police was undertaken? How many other interferences has the prime minister made, have made over the last year after sending this loss of confidence letter? Was confidential information about the service commission being shared between the office of the president and that of the prime minister? Was there collusion by the president, prime minister, and police service commission chairman to derail the merit list from being sent to parliament? Or was it just a coincidence that it all happened to be at president's house on the 12th August 2021? Or is it the 11th of August? So I'll come back to those dates because like the budget, the maths just not matching, mats it, mats not mats it. When asked by a reporter whether he denies meeting with the president, the prime minister defiantly retorted that he does not deny it, and furthermore, that he can meet with the president 24 hours a day, seven days a week, adding he doesn't have to tell anybody what they would have spoken about. This confirms that the prime minister sees himself as a supreme leader, as a dictator. He wrongly believes that he's empowered by the Constitution to do whatever he wants without having to account to anybody. I turn now to the office of the President. It is respectful to the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago and to the very Constitution that Her Excellency swore to uphold that after weeks of silence, Her Excellency chose to issue a paid full-page advertisement in the newspapers rather than facing the media to answer questions. Indeed, Her Excellency could have had a, a broadcast to the nation so serious issues were being raised in a constitutional crisis that we are in. In a constitutional crisis of such grave importance, it is shocking that the President could not be bothered to address the citizens in person. Yet we know that the President is capable of speaking with the media, as she did once when she hastily convened a conference, media conference, on a trivial, trivial matter regarding a trip she had made to New York. If the paid advertisement was done to avoid Her Excellency having to face the music by having to field questions from the media, such a strategy can only serve to bring her office into further disrepute. You are also accountable to the people, Madam. It is further concerning that the President only decided to break her silence after the Prime Minister's rant on Saturday, as if to ensure that her message would not clash with his, and that the PM's message was to take precedence over the President's. To make matters worse, 
The president's paid advertisement has only further complicated the matter, creating more questions and answers, answers which our country desperately need. And these include, one, why did the president wait until October 17 to inform the country for the first time that an order of merit list was submitted to Her Excellency on 11th August, but then withdrawn? Why? Why did you wait so long? Why did the president allow the Republic to descend into chaos between then and now without providing this key bit of factual information to the citizens whom she serves? Why does the president refuse to let the citizens know whether the Prime Minister met with her on August 11th or August 12th to discuss his concerns about the order of merit list? If everything is above board, why is the president running from disclosing the public officials who met at President House especially in the light of the public interest. So something is very strange because it mats just not matsin. Let me share some documentary evidence with you. By letter dated 7th day of September, 2021, Her Excellency, through Nancy Arno, Director of Legal Services at the Office of the President, responded to one Arno Rambrogan, Senior Counsel, as the attorney at law for Ravi Balgobin Maraj. And in that letter, I quote from the, that said letter, the words contained there, I can confirm that Her Excellency the President, on August 12th, and I ask you to note that, on August 12th, 2021, received a letter of even date from the Chairman of the Police Service Commission, Ms. Bliss Sipasad. Ms. Sipasad thereby submitted in compliance with legal notice 183 of 2021 a list of suitably qualified persons as nominees to act in the office of Commissioner of Police. Continuing the quotation, by letter of August 13th, 2021, Her Excellency replied to the Chairman, no notification was sent to Parliament by Her Excellency for the granting of an acting appointment in the office of Commissioner of Police as no such procedure is mandated or provided for in law. I end my quotation there. And then I want to share with you something else, um, again, that shows that Mats is just not Matsin. We have in the public domain two affidavits, both sworn on the same date, the 20, <clears throat> both sworn on the 27th September 2021. One is the affidavit of, of a Corey Harrison, who is the acting director of personal administration. And this affidavit was filed in the matter with Ravi Balgobin Maraj. Then we have another affidavit sworn on the same 27th September by the acting deputy director of personnel administration, Helen Warner. Two affidavits. This one was sworn in a matter relating to Mr. Anand Ramesa against the Police Service Commission. Both these are conflicting statements, and the question we ask is which is true. So let's take Ms. Harrison's affidavit first, and I quote from paragraph 8 of that affidavit. A list of nominees was submitted to Her Excellency on the 12th August. There was delay by the Commission in carrying out its exercise Given the date of issuance of the 2021 order, it was done in less than two months. That is Mr. Harrison. I quote now from the affidavit of Ms. Ms. Warner from paragraphs 39 and 40 of this affidavit of Ms. Warner. I quote, the Police Service Commission has withheld submission of the merit list to the president after attempting to do so because of certain security concerns that came to his attention. As the Police Service Commission is not itself conducting the investigation, not being equipped to do so, to compile the security reports, the Police Service Commission cannot say exactly when the reports will be available for it to finalize its merit list. However, the Police Service Commission has a duty to have the security investigation done before finalizing the merit list. Paragraph 40 from Ms. Warner, I quote, the Police Service Commission will finalize its merits list when the security report is available because not only is it duty bound to act with alacrity, but it is not in the public interest for, nor good for the morale of the police service that there is not 
a substantive holder of the office of police commissioner. So first we have the letter sent to Mr. Ram Logan. Then we had the, um, the, the, the these affidavits sworn on the 27th of uh, September. And now we come to the, the letter to Anand Ram Logan, in which the president confirmed that on August 12th, the office received a letter of even date from this Sipasad. Then we had the two affidavits sworn on the 27th of September. And now we come to the published statement of Her Excellency, which was published in the newspapers over the weekend. In that published statement, Her Excellency said that the order of meritless was delivered to her on August 11, 2021. So who is lying and why? Which one is true? The conflict in all these statements raise more questions than answers. The president made no mention about the significant withdrawal of the merit list in a response to Mr. Ram Logan in circumstances where she knew that her letter was going to be used as critical evidence in a court of law. How many merit lists did she receive? Is it that time, one time on August 11th and another on August 12th? In saying that she had replied to Bliss Sipasad simply to indicate that no notification was sent to the parliament because this was not required by law. And by the way, we now know that is not true based on the court ruling. Why did the president not come clean and simply say, I no longer have any list to issue any notifications to the parliament because you withdrew the merit list you gave me? Why was such critical information being deliberately withheld from the court? Or is it that Her Excellency informed her lawyer, and by the way, her lawyer was Faris Arari, Attorney General. Is it that she would have informed her lawyer, um, who was represented in the court, but that the AG failed to inform the court about this critical piece of information? As a former judge, the President would know that she had a duty to make full frank disclosure to the court. This was a serious and deliberate omission on her part that was plainly relevant to the case. This was a material non-disclosure on her part of epic proportions. It is scandalous and disingenuous, to say the least. To compound matters, Her Excellency would have us believe that she remained silent when the merit list was given to her and was withdrawn, that she didn't ask any questions about why it was being withdrawn and on whose authority that she didn't seek to protect the Constitution by demanding answers because the Commission had completed the process and the Parliament and the public interest would have been prejudiced. Are we really expected to believe this Nancy story? Did the Prime Minister intervene after this merit list was provided to Her Excellency? If the President had concerns about legal notice 183, what did she do about it? How is it that the President, a former judge, so misinterpreted legal notice 183 paragraph 4 that she did not believe that the president had been given the power to send a notification forward to parliament by that law. Who in the police service commission and the office of chief parliamentary counsel gave the president this incorrect legal advice? Was the president privy to the report in relation to the matter in the public domain about firearm users license that has been playing out uh, recently in, in, the, in the media. Was it the President's business to bring those matters to the attention of the Police Service Commission? It is clear that the President is hiding her missteps behind technical English and literary services. However, these have cast further shadows upon Her Excellency's office. This is not a time to impress the country with her use of Queen's English. This is a time for transparency and accountability. The opposition now even more strongly maintains that Her Excellency has brought the office of the President into disrepute. I once again remind Her Excellency that no one is above the law. The opposition will continue to hold the President accountable for her role in the crisis we now face. It is in the public interest that the opposition has set in motion the process to investigate the President's actions. And based on the President's statement on Sunday, raising more questions and answers, it bolters the need for an investigation into this entire scandalous matter. The motion which I have filed in the Parliament to establish a tribunal to investigate the removal of Her Excellency as President of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago is required more than ever to determine the facts of the events that led to this constitutional 
abyss. It is my hope that the nation can embark upon this exercise designed to protect citizens, to protect the law, to uncover the truth, and to hold those in responsibility to account. In that regard, I have today written to Her Excellency the President on some of the matters that cause grave concern. This is a copy of the letter. And I'll just quote some parts of it for you and we'll put the rest of it on site online. I write with grave concern regarding the recent notifications and consultation letters sent by, sent by a good self concerning nominees to serve on the Police Service Commission. It is my respectful view that the Office of the President has lost all moral and ethical grounds to continue to participate in this nomination process, given the recent ruling of a High Court indicating that Your Excellency acted in contravention of the Constitution when you did not submit the uh, Police Service Commission merit list to Parliament. I am fortified in my view by the recent statements made by Your Excellency in the paid advertisement appearing in the newspaper 17 October 2021. In that advertisement, Your Excellency shockingly revealed that the Police Service Commission merit list for Commissioner of Police was sent to you, but was then withdrawn. At no time over the past month did Your Excellency disclose that the Police Service Commission merit list had been withdrawn. Furthermore, Your Excellency appears to acknowledge the fact that a public official was responsible for interfering with this process at President's House. I respectfully remind Your Excellency that no one in Trinidad and Tobago is above the law of our land. We must all respect the law. I call again for Your Excellency to disclose the identity of this public official and state categorically whether it was indeed the Prime Minister, Dr. Keith Rowley, or not. My respectful view is that it is in the national interest of Trinidad and Tobago for the Office of the President to adequately answer the many serious questions that are still outstanding. The process of appointing a new Police Service Commission must be paused until this happens. Otherwise, all appointments made in future will appear to carry the taint of political partisanship. The opposition refuses to participate in a pot potentially tainted process of nominations to the PSC until these very critical questions are answered. It has just been brought to my attention that at 4 or 5 p.m. today, the House Secretariat issued an order paper for an extraordinary sitting on Thursday, October 21, 2021, at 10.30 a.m. for the purpose of Section 361A and B of the Constitution. This is the order paper. And on this order paper is placed the motion that the UNC MPs filed in the Parliament, um, and it is placed on the older people, this older people. But I, I saw um, recently, I think it was on Sunday, the 17th October 2021, former House Speaker Barry Sinanon said that the Speaker has his discretion to choose on the motion against the President. I have the greatest of respect for Mr. Barry Sinanon as a very distinguished attorney at law and a distinguished former House Speaker. However, I, with greatest respect, I believe that he has erred in his interpretation of this matter. And on the basis of our standing orders, the Speaker has to put forward the motion for debate in the Parliament. And I tell you why now. The standing order 34 on page 22 of these standing orders states as follows. We have to note that standing order 34 of, of our standing orders does not give the Speaker any discretion to dismiss a bill or motion filed by a member unless it's dealing with increasing taxes or withdrawing money from the consolidated fund. So section 34, page 22 states, subject to the provisions of the Constitution and these standing orders, any member may introduce any bill or pro propose any motion for debate in the House and the same shall be disposed of in accordance with the standing order. So that's the first standing order. Then, when a question is proposed and so on as per standing order 34, and according to section 35 of our constitution, we have a motion that no way infringes with respect to increasing taxes or withdrawing monies from the consolidated fund. We move along. Our motion was uh, filed in accordance with the uh, 
constitution, sections 35, 36. So we are in keeping with the constitution on a motion and in keeping with the standing orders. Then we come now to standing order 40. Standing order 40 deals with the admissibility of motions to the parliament. And it says a motion must clearly indicate the issue to be raised for debate and include only such material as may be necessary to identify the facts or matter to which the motion relates. The speaker shall be the sole judge of the admissibility of a motion which shall satisfy the following conditions. Yes, she's the sole judge of the admissibility, but it must satisfy these conditions and once they do, then it must go forward. So our motion clearly identified the issue to be debated, that is the establishment of a tribunal to investigate um, the conduct and so on of the president. Secondly, we do not breach the earlier standing order about taxes and so on. And this 3440, standing order 40 says a motion shall raise substantially one definite issue. That's what we've done. It must not contain ironical, offenses, expressions, or words that could be not would not be permitted in debate. It must not contain the names of persons unless they are strictly necessary to render the motion intelligent. It must not raise for debate matters of conduct of persons except in their public capacity. It shall not revive discussion of a matter that has been discussed in the same session. It shall not raise for debate a matter which already qualifies to be discussed. It shall not relate to matters which have been referred to a committee of the House for consideration report. And it should not exceed 250 words in length. We have complied with every single one of these conditions in the motion that we have filed. Upon review, the motion filed by the opposition satisfies each of these each criteria stated within Standing Order 40 and must be deemed valid. Then we go to Standing Order 48.8. This acknowledges the fact that substantive motions can be brought against the President and the states of page 30 of the Standing Orders. 48.8. The conduct of the President or any other person performing the function of President Members of the Senate, the House or judges of the Supreme Court of Judicature, or other persons performing judicial functions shall not be raised except upon a substantive motion moved for the purpose. Ours is clearly a substantive motion brought pursuant to under Section 35 and 36 of our Constitution. So I, I disagree with the greatest of respect with Mr. Barry Sinan. This is not in the discretion of the Speaker to. Uh, withhold the motion being placed for debate in the House of Representatives. We look forward to that debate because we do believe that there must be transparency and accountability and this is the only mechanism, this motion is the only mechanism to hold the President to account for her conduct. There is no other mechanism. The Rowley PNM can try to subvert, undermine and abuse our sacred rights, our freedoms and the doctrine of the separation of powers which is a central pillar of our constitution. But as, as long as they do that, they will always be the rising sun. They can try to operate in the darkness and shadows for however long, but as we have seen, what is in the dark always comes to light. They know the UNC is on their heels. Prime Minister Rowley knows it. A.G. Farris knows it. Minister of National Security Stewart knows it. Everyone knows it. And they are getting desperate. Just look at the behavior of the Prime Minister over the weekend, it was a total embarrassment to that lofty office. The Prime Minister also had a meltdown because he knows we are coming for him, politically and legally so. The UNC will continue to be that shield that stands in front of citizens when faced with a gangster government, dictatorial government like the Rowley PNM. We will continue to fight inside the parliament, outside the parliament, and wherever citizens are being taken advantage of, we will stand with you. I thank you. May God bless you. And may God bless Trinidad and Tobago.